When you design a control system, you have two main goals. Get the system to track a set point or the command that you've given it, and reject any disturbances into the system. Really though, it's the same goal. You're trying to get the system to do what you want while the environment is throwing you off course. In addition to disturbances, there's noise in your system that makes it difficult to figure out whether the system is actually off course or not. And we spend a lot of time touting the benefits of feedback control to handle these very things. They can track a set point, reject disturbances, and if the noise is high enough frequency, then the feedback controller can filter it out or ignore it completely. Feedback control is pretty powerful. In practice, however, a feedback-only controller is not necessarily the best architecture. In this video, I want to explain some of the benefits of pairing your feedback controller with one or more feed-forward controllers. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. To begin, let's look at how set point changes, disturbances, and noise are handled in a feedback controller. Remember, our controller works off error. That's the difference between the set point and the measured state of the system. So anything that produces error, our controller will see. When the set point changes, the state of the system hasn't had a chance to respond, and so that directly affects the error term. When disturbances act on a system, they affect the output of the system, which is measured by the sensor as a change in state, and that causes error. And finally, noise in the sensor affects the measured state of the system, which again is fed back and causes error. The set point change and disturbance is error that we want the controller to actually respond to and correct. The noise, however, is error that we want the controller to ignore because it's not real state error. But here's the problem. Since all of the error is combined before the controller, it can't tell the difference between them. So what can we do? Well, let's take a look at these sources of error in the frequency domain. Perhaps the set point changes you're commanding are relatively slow, and therefore low frequency. Maybe the disturbances are a little bit faster, but still much slower than the high frequency noise in the system. In this case, a common way to remove the noise is to set your controller bandwidth, or the range of frequencies that it'll respond to, low enough so that it doesn't react to the noise, but fast enough that it will respond to disturbances and set point changes. Let's try to understand this in a more intuitive way by trying to follow this red dot with your eyes. So keep your eyes on it. When you track a moving object with your eyes, you are the controller, and your eyes are the sensors, and the eye muscles are the actuators. This is a feedback control system, and it has a certain bandwidth. That is, there's a frequency of motion that your eye muscles can keep up with, and some motion that is just so fast you can't possibly follow it. Therefore, if the changes to the set point and the disturbances into your system are both rather slow, and the noise into your system is rather fast, then your controller, or your eyes, will follow the set point and correct for the disturbances, but not be able to follow the noise. So this is great, but what happens if the noise in your system overlaps the set point change frequency or the disturbance frequency, and you're unable to filter out that noise in some other way? then your feedback controller will react to the noise unless you lower the bandwidth even more, slowing the controller down. In this way, it won't react to the noise, but you've also reduced its ability to quickly follow the set point or respond to disturbances. Not great. This is one scenario in which a feedforward component can help. Feedforward can be used to remove a lot of the set point and disturbance error before it ever gets to the controller. And with these errors removed, then all that is left is the noise error. And at that point, you can set the bandwidth as needed to just ignore the noise. This is, of course, an ideal situation that's tough to get exactly perfect in real life. But to understand what FeedForward is doing and how it can help our feedback controller, let's start by focusing on how FeedForward can remove the bulk of the error created by a changing set point. The set point can change, for sure. But usually it's not a surprise when it happens, because you or some process that you wrote requested that change. And if you know that a change is about to occur, why let it create error in the system first, and then have that feedback controller respond and generate the necessary control output second? Why not predict ahead of time what controller output is required based on your knowledge of the set point change? What other information would be needed to accomplish this? Well, let's see. 
If we play a signal U of S through the plant G of S, then it will generate the output Y of S. And if this output is the state we're trying to control, that is, we're measuring the state of the system directly, then Y of S should be equal to our set point R of S. And that's the goal. If they're one and the same, then the system is behaving the way that we want. Well, Y is equal to U times G. So what input U will generate the set point that we want? Well, it's simply R times G inverse, where R is the set point and G inverse, or the inverse dynamics of our system, is our feed forward controller. And if we have a perfect model of our system and that model is invertible, then we can adjust the output of the controller with our perfect feed forward term. And since that will create an output that perfectly follows the set point, there's not going to be any contribution to the error term from the set point change, effectively removing that error from the problem. But there are two issues with this statement. First, with model-based design, you already have a good model of your system, and so you have something that you can invert. And that's good. However, as you can imagine, no model is perfect, and therefore G inverse isn't perfect. Which means that the output of our system isn't the set point R, but something close to it. So while the bulk behavior of the system may be accounted for with this method, there will always be some residual error due to the process dynamics that aren't perfectly understood. And second, not all process dynamics are invertible. In fact, most of them aren't. It's easy to imagine this for the case where the system has delay. That means that when you command an input, it takes a certain amount of time for the system to even begin to respond. So that when you apply U, Y doesn't begin to move until some delay time later. Now let's look at the inverse of this by thinking about how you would go about building a feed forward controller for this system. At time equals 10 seconds, the set point begins to change, and you want the system to follow along. Basically, you want the output Y to lie directly on top of the green set point line. In this case, you would have had to start the command U earlier than the set point change, so that when the delay occurs, the output would start to change right when you change the set point. And unless you absolutely knew exactly how the set point was going to change in the future, then this prediction is not possible. So rather than invert the dynamics exactly, we usually try to fit a causal and realizable model to the inverse dynamics as best as we can. So with both of these modeling limitations, it's impossible to completely remove the set point change error, but usually we can reduce it a lot. In this way, the feed forward controller takes care of the bulk behavior and the feedback controller corrects for the modeling errors. The goal is that these modeling errors can be corrected by a low bandwidth feedback controller, one that will still ignore the higher frequency noise. So we've taken care of the set point changes. Now let's focus on the disturbance error. And for the moment, let's assume that we know the disturbances to the system perfectly because we're able to measure them. If this is the case, then we can treat them in the same way we did the set point changes and design a disturbance feed forward controller. But what is the perfect feed forward controller transfer function? Is it the inverse dynamics again? Well, our plant now has two different inputs, the controlled inputs U from the controller and the disturbance inputs that are acting on various parts of the system. Both inputs, however, affect the output Y. Therefore, there are two different transfer functions. There's the disturbance path, GD, and then there's the process path, GP, and the output, Y, is the summation of the two. So here's the thing. When a disturbance acts on the system, it will affect the output. And so if we can adjust the process input, U, at the exact same time so that the GP path perfectly cancels out the GD path, then there will be no change to the output of the system, and therefore no error will result. To solve for this, we set y of s to 0, which means that we don't want any change to the output, and then solve for the necessary u of s. We get d of s times the ratio of gd over gp. So our perfect disturbance feed forward controller is the disturbance transfer function divided by the process transfer function. But as you can imagine, this feed forward controller has the same problems as the other one. One, we don't know the process and disturbance transfer functions perfectly. 
and two, we still need to invert the process dynamics for this to work. But in addition to these two problems, we now also need to find a way to measure the disturbance. Some disturbances lend themselves well to feed-forward control. For example, imagine a system that is trying to maintain the temperature of an object. If it's too cold, the feedback controller adds heat, and if it's too hot, it removes heat. And the heat loss of the object is dependent on the ambient air temperature. The colder the ambient air, the faster heat leaves the object, and therefore the more energy it takes for the controller's heating element. If this system had an ambient air temperature sensor, then you could predict how much heat is being lost to the environment and feed that control forward into the heater to automatically bias the base heating amount accordingly. This would work nicely, especially if the ambient temperature changes quickly, like someone opened a door to the outside and let in a bunch of cold air. But some disturbances are a bit trickier, like trying to measure and predict the effect of wind gusts on a car. These would be hard to measure, and in this case, it might not make sense to try to build a feed-forward controller. So the next time you're struggling with trying to get your feedback controller to respond quickly to set point changes or disturbances, it's worth investigating whether adding one or more feedback controllers will help your situation. If you were only watching this video to get a general idea of feed-forward and why it's used, that's awesome. But I think this will all make a lot more sense if you implement your own feedforward controller and practice adjusting it to see how it impacts the system. In Simulink, you can do just this, and it's in graphical form. So it allows you to think about the control architecture in block diagrams, just like how I drew it out in this video. Specifically, there is a good tutorial that I linked to in the description that covers designing a system to control temperature in a heat exchanger. In this example, liquid of varying temperature is flowing into a stirring tank. And we're trying to keep the tank temperature constant by adjusting a valve that controls the amount of steam through a heat exchanger. And when the tank temperature drops, we open the valve more, letting more steam through and adding more heat to the tank. When the temperature of the liquid flowing in changes, this acts as a disturbance in our system. So let's walk through the highlights of solving this problem because I think it's worth showing how powerful feedforward control can be. To begin, let's say that we've already experimentally determined the heat exchanger model, or the process model GP, and the disturbance model GD. So we have estimations of how changing the voltage of the valve controller and how changing the fluid temperature coming into the tank plays through our system. Let's first look at just a standard feedback controller. When we wrap a PI controller around the process and set the proportional and integral gains to the values that were calculated in the tutorial, it produces a nice step response. This means that for a fixed inlet temperature, if we want to raise the tank temperature by 20 degrees, it would take about 15 seconds to start warming up and then about another 25 or 40 seconds or so to reach the commanded temperature. So our feedback controller does a pretty good job. But once we're at steady state, let's say that the inlet temperature drops suddenly by 10 degrees. This disturbance would ripple through and cause a tank temperature variation that the feedback controller would remove slowly, but not before there was a large temperature drop in the tank. So now let's see how adding feedforward control on the disturbance path can help this. We can measure the inlet fluid temperature and adjust our controller output to start adding heat to the tank before the tank temperature is affected. Remember, our feedforward controller can be calculated as the negative ratio of GD over GP. In our case, that would create this transfer function. This is saying that about 20 seconds after we measure a disturbance, then we want to start adjusting the steam valve per this transfer function. And if we do that, then we will add heat into the system that will cancel the heat removed by the cold fluid. And now if we run this simulation, you'll see that that is indeed the case very little deviation from steady state. However, since we're working with models and we know them perfectly, then we were able to cancel out the disturbance really well. With real hardware, we won't know the transfer function perfectly, so feedforward can only reduce the impact and not remove it completely. We can demonstrate this by changing the feedforward controller parameters slightly. Now when we run this disturbance, we will have a larger effect on the tank temperature, but still not as much as the feedback-only control system. All right, let me duplicate the system real quick and remove the feedforward controller in one of them so that we can compare before and after. 
Notice that feeding forward the disturbance did not change the way the system reacts to set point changes. We haven't changed the way the system will respond to commands, only to disturbances. And that's pretty cool. And also that's where I want to leave this video. There's a built-in MATLAB demo that you can play around with by running heatx from the command line. This will bring up an interactive GUI that will let you switch controllers between feedback only and feedback plus feed forward, so you can get a more intuitive feel for how all of this is working. I've put links to this demo in the description so that you can run this on your own. And if you don't want to miss the next Tech Talk video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.